Hi everyone. Um, this is probably the worst timing slot because it's after lunch and everyone is ready to doze. I will try and not be boring. Uh, my name is Soila Kenya from Kenya. Yes, that's my real name. Catch me after this for that story. Um, I'm from Good for Africa and I'll be speaking about how we are building communities in Africa in order to contribute towards um, building an open data base for you know, different countries on the continent. And obviously, as they always say, Africa is not a country. Um, so I'll be specifically talking about Kenya and Nigeria. So just, uh, oh, and for anyone tweeting, that's my handle. I know we are trending, I think, in Portland. I don't know. But yeah, um, so that's my handle on Twitter. Um, very, very briefly, I'll just you know touch on what Code for Africa is. Um, we've probably heard of some of the other Code for All organizations, but basically Code for Africa is a civic tech and open data lab that has um, these labs across different cities on the continent. Um, some, uh, you know, we exist in multiple cities in some of those countries. And yes, that, that's a very brief description, but we do a lot of stuff and we deal with a lot of projects. But the main thing we deal with is this, which is kind of very scary, especially I think for people in this room, um, because it's like a visual representation of what we're used to seeing on the screen or you know on our laptops or whatever. Um, and I guess I should say disclaimer, I'm a journalist, so whatever inferences come with that. <laughs> yeah, yay, <laughs> another journalist in the audience. Uh, we are we're rare species right now, but yeah, <laughs> we'll survive. Um, so this is somewhere in Nigeria in, an, in a government office in the, I think it's the Ministry of Information. And these are government gazettes, um, you know, important information in there, but you can see where they are. So this is what Code for Africa is dealing with at a very base level, you know, digitizing dead wood. By the time, um, you know, open data, not to mention data, had picked up and flown in the West, we were still dealing with this, trying to contend with, you know, this gargantuan task of where do you even start? So one of the projects we started up is called Open Africa, and Open Africa is simply an open data, um, you know, database um, available on the internet, where, you know, any user, citizen, um, can upload their data there, um, and have it shared. So you can upload in various different formats, but we of course um, encourage uploading in CSVs, roll credits, I guess. Um, and so, you know, we ourselves are not researchers. We ourselves are not gathering data, but we want the community to do so. So, okay, data, open data, this concept, um, how do you get buy-in from, you know, different people? Um, yes, as I was mentioning, you can upload your data sets. Um, literally, you just need to log in and register and you can start using it. Um, and then we also have data requests, um, which is really cool and fun and, you know, an interesting way to interact with, you know, people using the site because sometimes when you have a website, it's like, okay, in this lonely corner of the internet of mine is anyone you know running across my stuff. So this is a good way to see people interacting and asking for things. Um, this is just a screenshot of like some data requests we get. So it's all across the board, all sorts of different things because we're literally starting from zero. Um, but yeah, w as I was saying, how do you get buy-in from communities? So one of the things we insist on is that the data we have on there is actionable. So there's lots of different information on lots of different things, um, and it would be fun to have them all online, but we'd rather start with the stuff that actually would cause some change, some ripples, some reaction, um, or would be useful in one way or another, and that's the information we're interested in uploading on the site, at least for now as we start. and. The best way to do that is not by us sitting in our offices thinking of you know, what's actionable information. It's just by getting the communities that need it to actually get it themselves and use our site in the process. So you know, these are just some of the communities that we, we've started off with. And you know, NGOs, researchers, CSOs, we have 
a really large organization called ILRI. Um, it's a li it deals with uh, livestock, and they use our site to you know store their data. That's like really interesting. Meaning there are people out there who are looking for places on the internet to house their data, but they just don't have anywhere where you know they can do that. Um, as I said, you know, having a lot of these organizations just have this data, but you know, it's either in those files, in you know, physical copies, which is useless, I guess. Um, and you know, they're doing some interesting research. They would like people to find their stuff. Um, so one of the big wins we've had is. is specifically for journalists, especially as a journalist, I will be focusing on how we've managed that with journalists. I think journalists are notoriously, <laughs> let me not say snobbish, since some of them are in the audience, <laughs> but they're like, you know, we know what we're doing, thanks, goodbye, you know, we don't want any new stuff, even for journalistic things. Um, but we manage, like a lot of those organizations you're seeing on there are newsrooms, media houses. And how did we manage them, manage to get them on board? Ta-da! I'm sure we've all heard of data journalism by now, um, and it's been picking up um, slowly on, on in various countries in Africa, and you know, especially in Kenya and Nigeria. And so we've been leveraging that to get them excited about open data and to actually start practicing, you know, just the basic rules of how to deal with data, especially data online. And so one of the other projects we have at Code for Africa is called Census Africa, which is simply, you know, using sensors to map air quality on the continent. And about, you know, six months after the project started, the team realized, okay, we already have six months of data from, I think it was Nairobi, Kampala, and Dar es Salaam. And of course, you know, air pollution, climate change, all these environmental, you know, tracks are really good beats for journalists. So we're like, why don't we just start writing stories? Or, you know, we ourselves are not a media house, so we're like, okay, we'll find people, journalists who are interested. But of course that's not going to work. You can't just be like, here, have our data. They'll just look at you like, what are you saying? What is that, you know? Um, so what we did is, me and someone else just did stories because in-house we do have a couple of people who are originally journalists. And I wrote a story on how air pollution affects children in Nairobi because apparently it does affect even cognitive development, like the brain, um, not just you know respiratory infections and things like that. So I did a story on that and I won an award. And the other lady also who's from Nigeria, I think I have, yeah, this is her. Um, she also won an award. So, you know, when we go to newsrooms, because we do, through our other projects, we do trainings and things like that. And we tell them about how you know, journalists are winning awards for writing data-driven journalism. It's like, that was it. That was the magic <laughs> thing. I guess people like awards. I like awards. I'm guessing everyone likes awards and being recognized for things you're doing. So that apparently was the buy-in we needed. And I could just fill these slides with people winning awards because <laughs> especially last year, 2018, um, we had so many people winning awards because they had now bought into this thing. And of course, just write one small story, you go apply for all the awards that <laughs> exist. Especially right now, data journalism is sort of a hot thing, so there's lots of things, you know, grants, fellowships, things going on. And especially with the, with the journalists in Nigeria, Nigerians are very, because, you know, all these countries have their own um, cultural, you know, ways they do things. Nigerians buy into things very quickly. They're up for anything. Um, they'll talk to you, they'll respond. They're just, you know, really active. So we had so many of them win, and then the Kenyans were like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> What's not happening? So they wrote stories, they started winning awards. So it was this thing going on. And in the background, Open Africa is like, you know, <laughs> evilly, like, you know, stroking our cat or whatever, um, because we've now had journalists buying into this thing called data. 
and not only data, but open data, because they would put it up on our website and have all the stuff their newsroom has done surrounding data on there. So we were somehow managing what we wanted to do just by finding a way to sort of interact with certain communities, in this case, the journalist, you know, journalism community. And that grew into something else. So we have this community that we're trying to grow in different African countries called Wana Data. And Wana Data is a Swahili word that has two meanings. Swahili is the language of Hakuna Matata, I guess. I don't know. Um, I think Lion King just made that famous. But um, it means either um, those who own the data or children of the data. So that's a lucky find on a name. Um, and basically, these are women journalists who work with data and who do data-driven stories. And that's how you know um, this lady Tobore also got involved. She was a one data, and so you know we have this whole network that's now writing data stories and therefore using open data. It's super exciting. I myself am a Wana data. I think I was the first one like before we had a website or anything. And it's so exciting to see more and more people. Um, we meet every month um, in various countries. We have meetups in Nairobi, um, Kampala, Dar es Salaam, I think Joburg, um, Lagos, Abuja, Benin. And it's growing really fast in just one year. We've existed for pretty much one year. And we've had all this traction. We also use our Hacks Hackers communities. Um, Hacks Hackers is basically you know, techies and journalists coming together to discuss interesting stuff. Our most recent Hacks Hackers in Nairobi was a scrapathon where we scrape data that one of our community media houses needed that data for something, for a story they were doing, and we helped them scrape it. So, you know, sort of just fulfilling, you know, ticking many boxes with one thing. Um, and then everyone goes home happy. And outside of the communities that have been built around it, um, we now have had a few other things going on. So an, uh, an example is a project that Wanadita took up very early on in its existence, where we simply took um, gender data from the World Economic Forum. They have this gender pay gap report every year, and we used it to build a website where you can put in, you can choose the African country that you're from, put in a salary, um, put in your gender, and you'll see what the other gender earns in, you know, in contrast. So of course, overwhelmingly, women earn, um, women earn less. So it's just really striking to see that visually, because if I tell you that women in Kenya earn 55% less than men, that's very abstract and like no one knows what 55% is. But if you see the bars and the thing is halfway and you're like, wait. <laughs> so we've had such, um, you know, sort of, it's sort of a journalistic thing, but a techie thing at the same time. So we've had such projects. And then we've also had other websites being built off this one, such as Takwimu, which is basically data, but specifically development data for countries. We have about 10 um, African countries on there, and you find it's, it's mainly for people who are interested in development in those countries. So it has very basic information about their politics, economics, um, and things like that, so that you know people within those communities can see that data and start making informed decisions and you know move forward change in, in their communities. Then lastly, we built a MOOC. Um, which has, among other things, you know, data journalism and stuff like that. But as Open Africa, we're like, we have to take this opportunity. So we built a couple of courses surrounding open data. Um, and we've been sort of, you know, going around to newsrooms and journalism schools training. And then we throw in, you know, open data in there, talk a bit about it, you know, tell, you know, this the usual sort of coaxing that we've realized we need to do um, in order to sort of build that community and get people. So at, we don't upload data, it's just them. Um, and so that's, that's basically what we've been doing. And so this is um, in Kenya now. This is an office in Kenya of land title deeds in an office somewhere. and. 
I mean, it's the same situation. It's quite big, it's quite huge. But what you've been able to do is take that nearly vertical cliff and sort of, you know, incline it just a bit to be a more, like we can at least, you know, crawl up it one step at a time. And yeah, that's it. I'm done. <laughs>